Hey folks, I'm your host, Corey, aka The Hardcore Skeptic, and I've got a few things to let you know before we get to this interview. First off, I want to say thanks to everyone who agreed to be interviewed for this project. I've learned a lot about the arguments against social justice, and I've learned a lot about the answers to those arguments. This project was supposed to be a compilation of various interviews, research, and commentary into one long episode, but after doing so many interviews, I came to the conclusion that I needed to do things differently. So instead, I'm editing and releasing each interview on its own with a final commentary episode on the subject after the interviews are all released. And I think that I'm going to stick with this format going forward into other subjects. I always planned to examine other subjects in the future, and I will do that, and I will do this exact same format, I think. Doing interviews, releasing those interviews, and then commentary in a final episode. This one is a bit short, Uh, I tried to aim for about an hour long for most of them, but this one's a bit short. I was still feeling out the process a little bit, and uh, I didn't really know where I was going with things. I hope that I do justice to Trav's points, and that they are just as happy with the interview as I am. Uh, They were the first of the interviews that I did, and in that regard, didn't get the same level of quality as some of the others did. Uh, You'll be able to hear over the next 20 interviews how my experience increased and my ability to interview improved, I think. And that, I guess that's all the caveats I can give you for now. I hope you enjoy the interview and I'll do a bit of a breakdown or a few comments after the fact. Enjoy. My name is Trav Mamone. I am the host of the By Any Means podcast and the co-host of the By Skeptical podcast. I am a blogger and freelance writer who writes about the intersections of social justice and secular humanism. And to me, social justice is basically human rights you know to me social justice includes you know racial justice uh, women's rights lgbtq rights uh disability rights um and so you know i basically always believed in human rights and so that's why i don't know if i should call myself social justice warrior i mean i call myself that just for shits and giggles but to a lot of people social justice warrior is like you know basically a left-wing troll it's like well no i don't really troll people i'm actually trying to engage in conversations so if you want to call me a social justice warrior you can but if you want i i personally consider myself a humanist i can appreciate that um I guess, so you said uh, social justice is basically just uh, humanism, right? Yeah, basically. Although, I mean, humanism, we all know, is uh, life philosophy, not just, you know, human rights activism. You know, it's about, um, you know, how to have a fulfilling life without religious dogma. But I think the worth and dignity of all people and fighting for human rights is part of the humanist lifestyle. Yeah, no, that sounds about right to me. Um, So what do you think of the different groups and how they fit into social justice, like, uh, say, LGBTQ and uh, Black Lives Matter and uh, various other movements? Um, well, I like to have a more intersectional approach to my social justice uh, work because, you know, for, like, l- l- let me give you an example. Like, for LGBTQ rights, you know, if I basically just talk all about the stuff I go through as a white queer person, you know, as if, you know, I personify what it means to be, you know, LGBTQ in 21st century. Well, basically, I'm pushing aside and silencing, you know, my LGBTQ friends of color. It's like, you know, if I'm going to... if I'm going to fight for my right to exist, I should fight for their right to exist as well. And so everything sort of 
intersects in a way where it's like, um, you know, basically I just, I like to apply sort of a intersectional approach to my uh, social justice activism. So you're not uh, necessarily uh, playing a game of oppression Olympics, as Dave Rubin likes to say? No, because I know that if I, it wouldn't be right for me to say, you know, oh, you think you got problems being a, um, you know, a black man living in America, try being, you know, a, a queer trans person. It's like, well, no, that's not how it, it's supposed to work. We're supposed to all work together for each other's liberation. Um, I always like to give this example to people. Uh, one of my dear friends is Sincere Carabo, who is the social justice coordinator of the American Humanist Association. He's a straight cisgender black man. I am a white bisexual slash pansexual um, gender queer slash non-binary trans person. He'll never know what it's like to be afraid to hold his lover's hand in public. I'll never know what it's like to be followed around by security in a store. He'll never have that moment of panic, you know, fear for his life when trying to decide which public bathroom he should use. I'll never have that fear, that moment of panic and fear. I'll never be in fear for my life when a cop pulls me over. Mm. We both, we both know this. And so we, we basically just work together for each other's liberation. That's how it should be, you know. For sure, that sounds sounds pretty reasonable from my perspective. Uh, I guess we'll move on to uh, how is is social justice an anti free speech movement? <laughs> um, I like to think that you need free speech uh, for social justice activism. Um, although this is something that I've been thinking about lately. Um, special, let's hone in on a specific um, situation. You know, the whole, the so-called, you know, uh, free speech crisis on college campuses. Now, <sighs> I think, I think people like Ben Shapiro, Christina Hoff Summers, Charles Murray, and of course, Melody Annapolis are full of shit. It's not just right. simply that, you know, they're, you know, they hurt my feelings because they disagree with me. No, they're perpetuating a lot of bullshit. And I, while I definitely support their right, their legal right to, you know, spout their bullshit, I also believe that bullshit should be called out and squashed. Same with religion, you know. I, th you know, I think that, you know, the Westboro Baptist Church has every legal right to, you know, say that God hates fags and, but, you know, I want, but that's still a horrible idea that needs to be pro, that needs to be debunked big time. Now, how to do that in a college situation? I don't know yet. Um, I've talked to a few people online. Like I actually messaged uh, Peter Bogosian about this because he's been talking all about this thing, mm -hmm. and I just asked him. I said, you know, well, I mean, there's. You know, if if someone's speaking at a college campus and, you know, they're they're saying things that have been proven to be false. Like, for example, I think Ben Shapiro says that uh, trans being transgender is a mental illness, even though all the science says that's not true. So, you know, how do you how do you combat that, you know, in a place of higher learning? And Peter said that, you know, you protest outside or you set up um, a sort of companion uh talk at the same time ben's doing his talk it's like okay ben's over here it's, uh, spouting his shit but then but then like a sort of resisting group would meet in another part and say okay here's why ben's wrong um it sounds great on paper but i don't know how it is it's f i don't know if it's you know uh how well it's done in practice so i'm i'm still learning you know yeah I, I, just uh I guess my bias, as you may have noticed, is uh, I'm very left. I'm I'm part of the social justice thing, I, as far as I can tell. I try to be anyway. Right. And uh, I don't know 
that uh, it seems like these problematic ideas are very, very popular. And yeah. just having a counter talk at the same time, it feels, it seems like, okay, so then you've got Ben Shapiro on one side with a packed hall and nobody to protest against him. And you've got a, a say a trans activist talking in another hall and they like, it seems like Ben Shapiro would probably still get all the media attention or all the attention when, you know, it should be. It should be focused on the counterbalance, but it doesn't work that way, right? Right, exactly. In the free in the free market of ideas, it seems like ignorance and bullshit are the top sellers. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Um. So, have you heard of uh, anybody complaining about social justice uh, being totalitarian or authoritarian in any other ways other than free speech? Um, well, there's a lot of controversy about, um, what's known as call out culture, where I can see it because there are certain individuals who, if you've ever said or done a problematic thing in the past, even if you have since moved on, learned your lesson, apologize, and are taking steps to not do it again, they still see it as, uh, you know, marked in your permanent record. So that, I think, is a little bit... Um, that I can see, you know. Um, I mean, I can't really say much because there are times when, you know, I've been called out on something and my first reaction was to be totally... Uh, defensive and say, you know, oh, you just hate me because I'm white or I'm red as male and this and that until then I have to give myself some space. I look back and go, oh, wait, I did fuck up. Never mind. Yeah, actually, I've noticed that you in particular are one of the more willing people I know to admit when they fuck up. I uh, I find myself that I, I will often... It, I will often get defensive in the moment and then learn later. Yes, exactly. And I, I, I have even more trouble when it's somebody I consider a friend that's being mm-hmm. called out. Like then I get, uh, it's almost like I get extra defensive. Oh yes, absolutely. <laughs> Not necessarily the right way to do things, obviously, but <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Are safe spaces something that is uh, an issue for or as you see them well it depends on what we mean by a safe space like to me a safe space means like say a campus lgbtq uh support group you know i definitely think in that situation it is not a good idea to invite a right-wing conservative christian anti-gay pastor to come in and tell everybody that they're going to hell neither do i think it's a good that's a great place to say oh you're not really trans you're just confused you're not really bi you're just confused that shit will not fly you know it's it, it would be i mean if we if we had like a campus atheist group you know you wouldn't want to you know um, deliberately invite <laughs> christians to come into the group and tell us all we're going to hell so you know that to me is a is what a safe space should be. Um, right. Now, there is the whole thing about whether or not making the entire campus a safe space. Um, I think if if making the entire campus a safe space means, you know, coming down on, you know, having a zero tolerance policy for sexual harassment, sexual assault, um, you know, racist attacks or anything like that i'm all for it but if it means that you know Miriam namazi can't speak at a college right. in, then no because i mean i mean Miriam namazi she's not she's like one of the most at least offensive or at least <laughs> Islamophobic. I don't, actually, I don't really know if offensive and Islamophobic. Let me put it this way. Ari, Ayan Hirsi Ali has a lot of anti-immigration political policies, whereas Miriam's very pro-immigration. But I wouldn't let... 
and I and I side more with Miriam's side, but I wouldn't let I wouldn't ban either one from speaking at a college campus. You know, you know, Miriam Miriam makes it clear that she's talking about Islam as a religion and and, and Islam. Islamism as, you know, a political force, not saying, you know, all Muslims are this way or that way. Right. Very uh, similar in some ways to uh, the message Majid Nawaz. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I uh, I find that I quite like some of the things that he says as well, and then other things I don't like as much, but... <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, yeah, so I guess something that a lot of people bring up with uh the not not letting people speak on college campuses is like no platforming and Mm -hmm. uh you mentioned ian hersia lee Uh, she has uh, at a college in canada Mm. been uh no platform she was going to get an honorary degree and they they pulled that honorary degree due to protests by students uh i'm just curious what you think of that um As far as no platforming in general, well, it's sort of tricky. I actually had an episode of the Bi Skeptical Podcast where I talked to Andrew Torres about the whole uh, thing. We mentioned that, you know, no platforming came from England to keep, uh, you know, white nationalists and Islamists from speaking on college campuses to recruit people. But as Andrew pointed out, they don't have the First Amendment over there like we do. Um... (laughs) So, he said, Andrew said that, you know, when it comes to private college, private institutions, they can have, they can, if they want to say, no, we're not having this speaker here, that's perfectly fine. But where it gets tricky when it comes to, like, state schools, you know, University of Maryland, University of Mississippi, you know, places like that, then it's, then they might be like, okay, well, technically you're receiving government money, and so you might be a little bit tricky there as far as the legal aspect. Um, Now, when it comes to Milo Yiannopoulos, uh, well, first of all, I don't think he's going to be speaking in any campuses anytime (laughs) soon. He's kind of gone now, I think. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But in those situations, what I would do is if, like, say, he was going to speak at my local campus, what I would do is I would write a letter to the dean. I would tell, remind him about the time that, you know, Milo basically singled out that trans girl and his one... um one of his one of his um, uh, speaking gigs, and basically be like, "You want transphobia on your campus? Because that's how you get transphobia on your campus." You know. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and then they have to f- decide whether or not that's something they want to uh, allow, right? Right. Exactly. I don't know if you listened to it, but I was in that debate on uh, on this topic of no platforming on university mm-hmm. campuses, and I kind of. So and I've been doing a lot of digging since, uh, just to research it. And it lo- sounds like like most even private universities are mm-hmm. still government funds. So oh, okay. It 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 begs the question. Or I guess it doesn't beg the question. That's not the right use of that term. But <laughs> it brings up the question that uh, like does getting government funds take away their autonomous? ability to de- decide these things hmm. that i'm not sure to be honest i'm still look i'm still looking for the answers like uh <laughs> like i told you you know yeah yeah it's it's like anything it's a complicated subject right oh yes absolutely so i guess uh what do you think of the idea of speech codes um I don't really know too much about speech codes. Um, I personally kind of believe in those situations sort of make things less socially acceptable rather than legislating things. Let me put it this way. I wrote an article for Everyday Feminism uh, about a month ago called Nine Things Not to Say to a Non-Binary Person. It wasn't meant to say, you know, ban these, (laughs) you know, problematic uh, questions or... Or, or, or phrases just make them just I'm just basically explaining you know that it's not cool to ask a non-binary person whether or not they're going to have the surgery or any trans person for that right, matter yeah. you know you know make things less socially acceptable although I haven't really um 
looked into the ins and outs of speech codes. I know that ACLU did an article saying that they're against speech codes and says, mm-hmm. instead, here's what you do to fight uh, racism and sexism and homophobia and transphobia on campus. Right. I haven't really, I just skimmed, skimmed the article. I haven't actually read the entire thing. Yeah, it, I read that article and it made me do a bit of a, a, a little bit deeper look at the whole concept of speech codes and uh, that same it came out the original concept seems to have come from that same uh, European idea or in Great Britain or the United Kingdom uh, as no platforming right and uh, it seems like I mean I read up on the, a fire I don't know if you know that website fire.org or whatever mm, no I don't they're about they're a free speech uh, advocate website they 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 track all the no platforming and all the web, all the university campuses that uh, do speech codes. Mm-hmm. They actually said that in the last few years, there's been a, a stark decline in the number of campuses that have speech codes on them. Mm, okay. Um, so I guess, what do you think about the people who are who take issue and spend time pointing out the problems in social justice, social justice movements. Sometimes they're, they're legitimate, but most of the times I think it's basically just, you know, whining to be honest, (laughs) you know, it's like, I don't know. It seems like a lot of the, what I like to call free speech warriors, um, I, I, I use the phrase free speech warriors uh, to mean those who advocate for free speech, but once you really listen to them, it's obvious they only want certain ideas exchanged in the free market of, in the free exchange of ideas. You know, I'm talking about people like Dave Rubin, who at one point will be like, oh, I love free speech, so that's why I'll have all these controversial right wingers on our show. But as soon as, but then like MTV did a video called New Year's Resolutions for White People, which basically just said, hey, white people, let's stop, um, let's stop being complacent with racism. And Dave was like, oh. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's like what happened to the free exchange of ideas? You know, yeah, that's right. Here's just an idea that you just disagree with, <laughs> right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I have found similar things. Like it seems very much like, oh, but we just don't want to be told what we can and can't say. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> so, is there a, a broad or like overarching? Uh, social justice movement or is it just a compilation of a bunch of different movements I think it's a compilation of different movements and hopefully if people are doing it right they all work together for each other's liberation you know Mm kind of like the American Human Association we have the three uh, sort of subgroups uh, Black Humanist Alliance Feminist Humanist, Humanist Alliance and the LGBTQ Humanist Alliance and um, you know, we try to all work together for common goods and causes. And so I think that's, I mean, that, that to me is how it's supposed to work. Um, now, it doesn't always happen, but at least that's supposed to how it works. Right. <laughs> yeah, there does still, still seem to be some conflict on occasion, but uh, yeah. I can see that. Uh, so do you think that this is uh, this uh, it's an advantage being uh, individualized groups or would it be better if it was more organized as a almost a monolith? Um, well, that kind of sounds a lot like the uh, why do we need labels arguments, you know, <laughs> right. Um Especially like a lot of like when the social justice initi- initiative for AHA started last year with the Black Humanist Alliance, the Feminist Humanist Alliance, and LGBTQ Humanist Alliance, people thought that you know the AHA was being divisive. But as our mutual friend Callie Wright, and she'll prob- she probably says this in her segment, we can't we can't fix the problems unless we name them first. You know. You know, sexism is a human rights issue. Women's rights is a human rights issue. But, you know, if 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 your first 
response to you know somebody talking about systemic sexism and misogyny is you you know something like like you know oh why is it got to be uh, just a woman thing or like a lot of people say you know oh don't say feminist say humanist say egalitarian you know it's like well that's because i'm i'm not talking about issues that affect you as a man i'm talking about issues that affect me as a woman you know yeah that makes sense so i guess uh just to na- like take a look at individual uh groups uh what do you think of uh say feminism and some of the backlash that that has gotten uh well i think basically it's you know a lot of people say that you know third wave feminism is like you know we were fine in second wave feminism but then it went to third wave feminism now it all went to hell it's like well i don't think third wave feminism or any branch of feminism is like you know a list of uh, stagnant beliefs right. um, the third first second and third wave they basically call it that to mark time periods you know not like you know a whole dogma or ten commandments or anything like that <laughs> um, you know so and they always paint like all feminists with the same brush you know like you know like, you know, oh, if you're a feminist, then, oh, you must mean you hate men. It's like, no, I don't, I don't hate men. I mean, I'm not going to, like, cater to their feelings or anything like that. I'm not going to say, oh, don't worry, you're one of the good ones. No, I'm, I'm not going to do I'm not going to do that either. But I'm not also going to say, you know, kill all men at the same time. So I don't know. I just feel like there's so much, like, broad, you know, brushing you know broad brush painting of you know feminism and feminist issues that it's literally hard to like you know have a conversation with some people about it you say the word feminist and they automatically shut you off like i know everything that's going to come out of your mouth it doesn't it doesn't matter like how many statistics you um present to me how many facts you show me you've already basically demonstrated every i are, i know everything i need to know about you and your positions just for just for saying that you're a feminist <laughs> yeah i uh i actually honestly don't really know the difference between third wave feminism and second wave feminism <laughs> i guess i haven't been immersed in the in the the whole feminist movement very much i guess but um do you know like like you said it's just about time periods is there any kind of philosophic difference between them well i know that uh, first wave um you know was you know the women's suffrage movement then you had the second wave in the 70s uh that came about with you know um uh, let's see here. Um, you know, finding sexism and stuff. Uh, and then third wave is basically just, I think it started like in the 90s or something like okay. that. Um, I do know that with each um, wave of feminism and each sort of decade, we kind of start discovering more issues <laughs> that affect women, not just, you know, white straight women but you know uh lgbtq women uh trans women women of color uh disabled women um and so base you know i think that if feminism wants to survive it has to keep acknowledging that you know being a woman isn't a um Women aren't monoliths, you know, femmes aren't monoliths, right. you know, like, like, I know there was a lot of controversy surrounding the women's marches around the world for the pussy hats. And a lot of trans women are like, well, wait a minute. Um, I was, I don't have a vagina. So does this mean I'm not included, you know? Right. Kind of. Yeah. It, it's not as inclusive as it could be. Hey. Right. Yeah. Hmm. That's interesting. I, uh, yeah. I mean, as I'm a cis white straight dude, so mm-hmm. <laughs> it's, 
I have to learn these things from other sources. I don't have these ex- same experiences at all. So right, it's, exactly. It's good to hear these things. Um, I suppose. What about uh, say black lives matter and the backlash against that? What are your thoughts on those? Um, base. I think, you know what? I think a lot of the backlash against uh, both Black Lives Matter and uh, feminism all come from the same idea. You know, okay, we needed, you know, the civil civil rights movement and, you know, women's liberation back in the 60s and the 70s when times were really bad. But things have improved since then. And so we should all just, you know get over it. it's like well, wait a minute no 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 we still have problems to this uh day you know like black lives matter basically came about because you know we mm-hmm. stopped talking about police violence against um uh black people you know killing of unarmed black people in america you know and and then of course it's also similar to you know People don't like the phrases Black Lives Matter for the same reason they don't like the phrase feminism because it talks about a specific group. You know, they say, oh, you should call yourselves All Lives Matter or you should be an egalitarian. Well, like I said earlier, um, we can't fix problems in society unless we name them first. And so, um, you know, Black Lives Matter doesn't mean only Black Lives Matter and, and, you know, fuck everyone else (laughs) neither does feminism mean you know only women matter and so screw everyone else is saying hey here it is it's 2017 yet we're still talking about this stuff you know now i will say this in every group you will have your nut jobs like i remember um reading somewhere some uh member of the toronto branch of the Black Lives Matter movement said something about kill whitey or that, you know, white, white people were, you know, genetically inferior. And I'm like, okay, yeah, that is kind of weird. But, you know, one or two people does not represent the entire group, you know? Right. Right. Yeah. It's too often. I think that an example like that is used to shut down the entire group and like to just disregard the entire group. Right. Exactly. So, okay. Uh, There hasn't seemed, uh, maybe, uh, maybe I'm missing it, but there hasn't seemed to be the same backlash against LGBTQ uh, progress as there has been against say feminism or um, black lives matter or or racial progress. Uh, Do you have, maybe a theory as to why that might be? I don't know, really. Um, a lot of the major progresses in LGBTQ rights have only happened in the last couple of years. I mean, it was only just two years ago <laughs> that marriage equality was legalized in all 50 states, yeah, you know? And true. so I think, I think people knew that it was a much bigger issue then. And so they weren't, there wasn't really like, you know, Oh, we settled that in the seventies. So, you know, you're, you're perfectly free now in in America, you know, <laughs> and uh, like nowadays when people are now starting to talk about trans issues, you know, um, th- I mean, you know, that's something we're still, it's, you know, the trans, you know, mainstream recognition of transgender people is just now starting, right? Right, right? So there's there's not that whole, you know, oh, we discussed that and we fixed that long time ago. You know, we don't need right, the LGBTQ right. rights movement. Even another 15 years. Anymore. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's no more homophobia. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so I guess just to close, uh, is there anything that you wish people could realize about social justice that seems that they seem to be missing? Um, what I would say, you know, Oh, wow. That is a good question. (laughs) Uh, Oh, wow. Stump me on this one. (laughs) I guess I should say, you know, don't I think there's this thing in society where if some if you know we tend to paint everyone who disagrees with us with a broad 
brush. And so if some people aren't really into feminism or they only have a limited um, knowledge of it, you know, and then they that sort of filters their the way they perceive other feminists and so if you hear a feminist say something like oh that's problematic they automatically assume it means you know oh you want to ban that word or you know you think you know uh all men are bad or or something like that um you know we don't really take a time to like really listen to what the other people have to say you know right even if the other side is wrong we still don't uh we still don't take time to listen first (laughs) no that's that sounds like a good idea to me uh so uh want to list all your plugs and where people can uh, access your writing and whatnot that would be cool Okay, sure. Just go to freethoughtblogs.com slash by any means, and that's by spelled B-I, and there you can uh, read my blog, check out my podcasts, and check out some of the other stuff I've written for, you know, for other websites. If you want to follow me on Twitter, my Twitter handle is T Mamone. Perfect. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you for having me. Okay, so I guess I'm, I just finished editing and uh, listening to this episode, this interview with Trav Mamone, and I'm just wondering, like, uh, what to say. Uh, I should have some commentary after the fact, and I took some notes while I was while I was listening, and it turns out that I, I basically agree with everything that they said. I, uh, I I look at the the points about human rights versus humanism, like. It, it makes sense to me that human rights or, or social justice is part of humanism, but there seems to be some pushback against that. Lots of people seem to think that that's not an accurate way to look at it, but uh, which I, I cover in a later interview a bit better with uh, Sincere Carabo. And that, that's near the end of the series, but that will be coming out eventually. I, uh, I, I like Trav made a point about... Uh, intersectionality and I I quite like the way they look at intersectionality like uh, it's it seems like it should be a a cooperation of different people with different experiences and different issues because uh, each kind of helping each other out and lifting each other up because not everybody who is trans has the same issues or experiences as a black person and not, and not everybody who is black or or first nations has the same uh experience or uh, you know and us white people uh sometimes we don't have the same experience we don't have many of these same experiences like uh white straight cis guys like myself i i have to learn about all this stuff after the fact from other people who are going through it or who deal with it and uh, I have to take not just what they say at face value, we, which is valid. I, I, it's fair to take somebody's experiences at face value at the way they view them. Even if you don't necessarily subscribe to the same mentality or same ideas as they do, their experience is what it is and you have no way to rationally dismiss that. Um, so it seems to me that this, this idea that intersectionality is, uh, is a helpful tool for everybody to recognize that they have different experiences, but can still work together on, uh, broader social justice, uh, views or like can help each other with each other's issues. It's, it, it makes perfect sense to me. I, I, I will, as time go, uh, goes on, we will. I will have interviews where this gets addressed and hopefully it clears things up for people. Uh, the college campus stuff, it's, I, I mean, like I say, I said in the interview with Trav, I did a, an interview or I did a debate on uh, no platforming. I don't consider that a free speech issue at all. Uh, in schools have 
in my opinion, they have to make these calls. They have to decide what's best for the school. And sometimes what's best for the school is not having a particular speaker speak there. So to me, it just makes sense that they can make these calls. And if they happen to cave to student pressure, you may disagree with the way the students behave. You may disagree with the protests against certain speakers, and you may disagree with them pressuring schools into changing uh, or disinviting or changing their minds. But the school themselves has no choice but to be able to make those calls on their own. They have to be able to do that. It makes no sense to think that a school is obligated to have a speaker there just because somebody invited them. Uh, to go further, uh, the idea that counter protests or, or no, or that we shouldn't protest certain people, the, uh, that the the idea that Peter Bergosian kind of told to Trav, um, I, I, I totally disagree with the idea that, oh, we'll just have your own talk at uh, on campus as well. And both people will have dr- attract the audiences that they attract and whatnot. And I think that's completely ridiculous as well. I think that the real only the only really good effective way to let these people know that what they're saying is something that is uh, as at issue then is by protesting or actively being in their talk and and making yourself heard in the question period. I'm not saying you should physically accost people and I'm not saying you should interrupt the talk per se, but if there is a talk that is going to be happening by somebody say like Ben Shapiro or Milo Yiannopoulos, then you should be able to go in there and during the question time make a point and or you can protest outside. I I fully advocate I fully endorse uh outside protesting and so and many people who uh are are what you might consider free speech warriors they also advocate for that but that was uh uh the point that peter bogosian told to trav was that they should have their own talk on the other side of campus or whatever and it just it seems like like trav said it seems like it works on paper but it doesn't work in practice. But anyway, uh, so something else that, uh, Trav wanted, Trav kind of, kind of put together that I, I took away from the interview was, uh, the idea that telling somebody don't say that, or that is a, a problematic thing to say, or that's racist or like it gets people on defense. It really does. But it's not the same as saying you cannot say that under penalty of law. It's, it's a different thing. And you can choose to disregard the person who's telling you that what you're saying is problematic. It, you're not obligated to listen to the person who takes issue with your words. Uh, and that's that's freedom. That's freedom of speech. And uh, quite often we get this idea that people are uh, shutting down speech when they tell you that what you're saying is bad. Or, or when they tell you that what you're saying is problematic. And it's, uh, it seems silly to me to take that as an affront to free speech. Like, you can just choose to disregard that person. You have fully the full legal freedom to disregard what that person said and go on with your life. The only reason to get defensive is if you realize that there's something to their statement that what you just said is problematic. And that's... <laughs> and that's a whole other issue. I I I won't even I can't really get into it, I guess. I don't have the expertise. Uh but like I'm just shooting from the hip here. Um I I did appreciate like uh Trav mentioned call out culture and the, and there is some issue with that. Like later on uh in the interviews, Callie mentions that there's a toxicity issue within call out culture and I can quite appreciate that. I not everything in the world can be called out and not everything needs to be called out. Sometimes you just ignore things that you don't like and that's fine. Um I quite like what Trav said about the feminist movement being mainly from different time periods. I I I myself haven't had any luck discovering any philosophic differences between first, second and third wave feminism. 
that is set in stone. Like there's no, there is no set in stone feminist philosophy that I can tell. Um, though I will learn that more when I, uh, re-listen back to some of my other episodes or interviews. And I hope that I can, uh, perhaps examine feminism on a deeper level sometime in the future. I, I really think that it's two last things I want to talk about before I start editing this and, uh, getting it ready to put out. Trav mentioned something when I asked them about what they thought they wished people would realize about social justice. And I think this is something that, uh, that many people, uh, seem to be having issues with, and that's listening, listening and spit instead of speaking. And that's part of what I'm doing here is like, I'm trying to learn to listen and maybe, maybe when we listen, I can, we can learn more and learn a little bit about people who are different than us and different perspectives. And I kind of think that that's something that everybody should be doing anyway. And I really appreciate uh, Trav for mentioning that. And also, and, and the last point was that you can't fix issues that you don't name. And that is at the root of much of this social justice. And, and quite often, the reaction to uh, social justice is, is rooted in this kind of idea that the more we talk about these issues, the more we bring them up, the worse they are. And the more we divide each other when, uh, when we, we, when we talk about race or gender or, uh, a sexual preference or sexual orientation or, um, or, or whatever, uh, like when we talk about these identities, as they say, then we're dividing ourselves. And, and as Trav pointed out, that's an issue in itself. Like that's, you can't fix things if you can't call them what they are. Um, you can, (laughs) I, I find that often some of these, some of these, uh, criticisms have been repeated in history. These kinds of things were said in the civil rights movement. And, uh, these kinds of things were said about early, early movements of feminism. And, and, and it, it strikes me as just dodging the issue. I, I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure that that's, I'm not sure that that's what's happening, but that's how it strikes me. So with that said, uh, Trav mentioned that you can find their blog at, uh, freethoughtblogs.com slash by any means for blog entries, podcast episodes, so on and so forth. If you follow Trav on Twitter, it's at team Amon, I think. Yeah, it's at team Amon. So with that said, that's the end of the episode. I hope that you enjoyed it. Uh, there's much more to come. I have, like I said, 20 interviews or more, uh, completed. I, I still have a couple people that I should probably reschedule with though. I'm at the point of near exhaustion with this topic. I, I, I feel like without doing deep dives on specific issues, then it's going to be very tough for me to really analyze this any further. Spreaker.com slash the hardcore skeptic examines patreon.com slash hardcore skeptic. You can find me at, at hardcore skeptic on Twitter or the hardcore skeptic Facebook page. You can contact me at mail at brainstormblog.net. Don't forget to check out my other show brainstorm podcast. And don't forget to uh, follow my new, new show with my friend Destin. It's going to be called Positively Skeptical. Uh, I hope to talk to you soon. And as always, remember, the truth matters.